Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, let's see. This is um, our second presentation on the invasive crazy snake worms. A couple of years ago, we had a um, uh, Joseph came and talked at the, um, the United Unitarian Church. And I don't know, maybe I'll just give you a little background. Um, maybe everyone didn't attend that, um, that talk. But um, a few years ago, several of us were noticing that there were these like <laughs> crazy worms that we had in our gardens. There, was, there were earthworms that were really big and very active. And we thought, wow, this is just nice. You've got some nice earthworms. <laughs> and then it turns out that these worms are very, very voracious, and we actually noticed that we, they were actually starting to damage our plants. And so, um, somehow or other, we found out they were called crazy snake worms, and Googled them, and found out that there was somebody right here in Vermont, at the University of Vermont, doing research on them. And so, um, that's how we got connected with Joseph Gorey's. And um, so we invited him to come and talk to us a couple years ago. And since then, he's been doing continued research. And so um, we thought it'd be good to get an update on that and also to bring other people into the conversation that missed that talk and also to just keep putting it out in our newsletter and try to spread the word because we think it's significant enough that if we can do anything about it, preventing the spread, it would be a wonderful thing. So um, we're really lucky today to have um, Orca Media from Montpelier Public Access Channel that's videoing this, and there will be a, the video will be available sometime. We'll make it. Uh, we'll let you know how to connect with that. We'll put a link on our website certainly, which is if you Google Hardy Plant Club of Orca Vermont, you can find our site. Um, also, we'll put a notice in our newsletters, and if anybody's not a member, there's membership forms here if you want to join. Um, and also, the, the article, um, let's see, we've, put some art, we've done some articles on Joseph in our newsletters, and uh, there's at least one of those posted on our, our uh, website, so if you want to check that out, it's also there. So, I guess I'll just turn it over to Joseph now and let him tell you what he's been doing since we last heard from him. Thank you, Joseph. Pleasure, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so if you haven't seen these ones yet, uh, roll these wonderful slides. Oh. So, um, you probably know now why they are snake worms. <laughs> and uh, the craziness is not shown there yet. I'm not showing that craziness. Uh, there's actually a little bit of a uh, inkling of craziness, we touch them, they were like the flesh yeah. about. And then the other crazy thing is that they lose their tail when you abuse them. And the, cra the, 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 the tail just whacks about like crazy, and the, the worm wiggles away. So uh, they're definitely crazy, and they are uh, in other places they're called jumping worms, uh, Jersey wrigglers, all sorts of names, uh, wood el uh, elves, uh, there's a whole bunch of names for them. Uh, common names. And so I, I go. Through, I will just give you a quick rundown on the history of things in a second. Um, so before I do that, I'd like to thank uh, a couple of people and a couple of organizations. So the Hardy Plant Club has funded part of my research, and then the Epi Foundation for Research uh, has also funded part of this research. And you notice that both of those funders are private funders. They're not. They're not the government. They're not the state. Uh, and we'll talk about that later, why that might be. I have a couple of grad students that work on this. Mariam is my present grad student, and she is uh, working really hard at understanding the genetics of these worms and where, where they might have come from and how many invasions might have occurred, how many introductions have been, have, might have occurred over the years. Uh, and then Erin Keller was a grad student with one of my, uh, my cohorts in, at the university, and she specifically looked at uh, parasites of these worms. And then we have a couple of undergraduate, well, a couple, quite a few undergraduate technicians that have worked with us and they're, they're doing a fantastic job um, learning science but also uh, helping science uh, in, for this project. 
Okay, so five parts to this talk as a quick introduction of what these things are. If you weren't here two years ago when I gave this first talk over in the, in the church, um, then I'll talk about the history and the current extent of, of the invasion. Um, and I'll get a little bit into Mariam's research, the sources of genetic variation that we see in Vermont, uh, and then the control of snakeworms towards the end. So you stay until the end, right? You don't want to know everything about how to control them right away. Uh, and then how you can get involved. What, what, are, what are some of the things that you can do that, that you will be able to do in the near future? It's really important that citizens and, and people get involved with some of this research. Um, right, so first of all, why do we worry? Why do we worry about this world? And that's a really good question because you know, all of us uh, grew up, so I grew up over in Europe, and of course, earthworms are great, but earthworms have been around there for much longer than over here. Right, so in, in Europe, uh, you're talking about uh, last glaciation was about the same time as here. Glaciation was what killed the worms here. Did the same thing in Europe. But people traveled around a lot more in Europe even five, six thousand years ago, not just three hundred years ago, four hundred years ago. So uh, these these earthworms sometimes are referred to as ferritinoids, um, and the, the name comes comes from a from a defunct uh, genus of uh, of these worms called ferritima. So that that doesn't exist anymore as a genus. Uh, it's really a messy taxonomy. You know, who is this worm? Right? What, what, does, what makes this tick? What does it look like? And a lot of them look really, really similar, and there seem to be a lot of crossing over, and it's just really weird. So, uh, because of that, that Ferritima genus has been split into like 15 different genera now. And uh, so, what you're going to do with you know, this, you have to have a name for all of them somehow, rather than going on, here's, here's all the genuses, genera that, that are out there, so we just call them Ferritinoids. And so some of this, uh, this all the snake worms are fertinoids, but not all fertinoids are snake worms. So there's actually 172 earthworm species in, in the US, and quite a few of those are actually native, but they don't exist up here in the north. There's, I think there's two species of native earthworms here, but how they got here is another question, whether they've been, always been here, um, or whether that just happened after the, the glaciation. Uh, there's, uh, one tenth of these, so about six, actually 16 uh, species of ferritinoids are, are known in North America. Uh, that includes Mexico and Canada. Um, and you know, all the ferritinoids are from one family called Megascholastica. So that's the boring part of this talk, what's out there. History of the coming invasions is really quick. So uh, this black line there is, is the extent of the last glaciation. And so north of that, there's no native earthworms, south of that, there is, there is native earthworms. And so the theory is that the earthworms that were brought over by the, by the European settlers um, are invading, first invaded the, the, the area above the uh, glaciation line, uh, but you also find them down in, in areas where there's native earthworms. So there's also an invasion harmful invasion going on of European earthworms. Um, and then there's a second wave of, of earthworms, uh, mega, that's the Megasglossidae and, and snakeworms, uh, and they came from Asia. So different directions. And um, ever since they arrived, they've been moving around with uh, horticulture, uh, with bait, uh, with bait and, and also uh, um, very composting facilities. So they have been used for bait? Yes, so they're, they're not necessarily the best bait, but I've been told by people that fish that they have used them for bait. So uh, because they're fresh about a lot, people think, oh, they're great for bait because they, they make their, their presence known in the water. But when you hook them, apparently they kind of explode because they have a lot of pressure in them. That makes them, that makes them feel so different, so different from the, from the European ones. <laughs> I think of European earthworm is like flaccid and limp and you kind, of, kind of drapes over your... These guys, mm. they're, they're stiff, they're really, they're really muscular feeling. It's, it's not that they have more muscles than European earthworms, they just have more turgor. Uh, when they explode, 
Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, there's this uh, angler that, that fish with them. Uh, that one has the best. Uh, it's actually there's actually a place that's invaded in, in uh, Georgia. There's a, a mountain top that's invaded by them. It's really far out from everywhere. And the reason why they're there is because there's a, a fishing spot and there's a, a, a small chalet there that where people go to fish and the owner actually put those worms there because he thought they were the greatest worms of fishing. And so now that's spread in, in the middle of nowhere uh, at high elevations. So uh, the first thing that happens when you hunt these worms is that they alter the, 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 uh, the forest soil. And so they, they produce this layer of, um, of castings that can be 5 10 centimeters deep, uh, which changes the way plants interact with, with that soil. So they're turning that nice uh, spongy layer in a typical hardwood forest into this layer of castings that's no longer spongy, uh, doesn't hold water well. Uh, you can, uh, some plants you can just pull up because the roots, the roots are not really well, uh, well anchored in them. And European earthworms also change the soil uh, quite a bit. So yes, but they produce a, a denser soil. They, they also get rid of that top spongy layer, and they turn it into um, a much denser layer as well, which also has an effect on forest uh, forest plants. So don't just think, all oh, those Asian earthworms are bad. European earthworms are also uh, messy. Okay, so forest ecology. This is sort of the actual, but also there's no other ones here. Uh, there's a picture near, near Kevinsham, uh, so you see what, what that lush understory looks like. And then uh, where you have these uh, snake worms, you have hardly any understory. Uh, you can almost tell when they arrive by looking at the age of the trees and the, the, uh, the saplings that are there. Do they actually harm the roots of the trees, though? Do they do what? Sorry. Harm. They, that's a good question. We don't know. They probably uh, harm the, any kind of uh, mycorrhizal, so fungal infections, which are actually important for many plants to get out nutrients. Mm -hmm. So it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's a big question here in Vermont is, you know, uh, do they harm sugar bush? Mm -hmm. And so people have found that wherever they go to sugar bush, they look at the regeneration rate of uh, of sugar maple, that there tends to be a lot fewer uh, saplings in the sugar bush than when the earthworms are not there. And so this is some of the data that we collected in Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and I think uh, upstate New York. Um, so number of saplings on the x-axis, here's the snake worms, here's your uh, other really big worm, is the, the night crawler, and then the last uh, data bar is uh, no earthworms at all. And so you look at the number of saplings, you have like a half a sapling per square meter where there's snake worms, and then you have three uh, for uh, the, the uh, number of stress the um, night crawler, and when there's no, no earthworms there, then you have six, six or seven. So there is an effect on even economically important species. Um, I skipped that slide, so. Uh, in horticulture, there's a few places where you find them. So you find them in, uh, in actually you find them in uh, raised beds. You find them in, um, in mulched, mulched beds, and then you find them just in, in uh, flower beds that have uh, leaf mulch rather than woody mulch. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So they they really don't care what what they feed on. Uh, they they're very flexible in, in their food sources. Anyway, so this one is, uh, is, is, uh, is an old uh, picture of uh, a, dis a deceased showy uh, uh, lady stripper. And uh, the horticulturist that was there said, thinks the owner of this, this nursery says, I think that's the worms that did that. This is the worms. You know, we don't really collect information about plant damage in nurseries, and that's probably one of the problems why maybe people are not willing to fund uh, this, because there's no reason. Do you have any, do you have any real data on um, 
on damage on, on plant and production. Uh, so this, this is the UPVM tree farm. Um, so we, we are spreading it in all, all, the, all the way around uh, Burlington. So, and then of course there, there's people like you who have plant sales and plant exchanges, uh, exchange safely, you know, that's a big question. There's CSA, there's, there's friends and families that exchange plants, and so, you know, the most important thing is try and exchange plants with bare roots. It's a real pain in the neck because washing roots uh, of soil is really, really hard. Um, Joseph, if, if you've got bare ground with no mulch or no cover, are there still roots there? There's, they could still be there. Yeah. But basically, you put mulch on your feet in them, yeah. so you're going you're to get more. So the horticultural trade is, is what seems to be moving them around globally. So the, uh, in the US, uh, current regulations say that you have to have clear root exchanges, uh, seeds and clear root. It comes from outside, so there's probably not many introductions into the US anymore. But within the US, there's already this huge pool of these, these worms that are moving around within the US. Um, and then a friend of mine said, well, you know, I brought in some plants with uh, their soil that just smothered them. So there's that happening as well. I'm not sure how, how big a contribution that is. Uh, and then there's a, there was about 15 years ago, there was a, a hosta producer in uh, Pennsylvania who had 30,000 hosta varieties. Uh, and People thought that the demise of uh, half of them, or whatever it was, two thirds of them, uh, was due to these, these worms uh, changing the soil and not allowing the, the roots to uh, have a hole in the, in the soil. Another way that they move around is compost. So here's a, here's a, a rock on, near, near my neighborhood in St. Albans. And people, you know, in the fall, they, they rake their leaves, they put them in these leaf bags. Leaf bags go to the side of the, the road, somebody picks them up, takes them to a transfer station, or people take, take them to the transfer station themselves. And, and those will most likely have, with our neighborhoods have, have these worms, will most likely have um, these worms in them. And you can go to the transfer station, you, get, you can get free mulch. People do that. Uh, and there's certain places where, uh, I think the, the Upper Valley is one of the places where they, they uh, uh, where the municipalities give away leaf mulch, and so if you want to have leaf mulch, you can pick it up. Uh, nurseries get, get leaf mulch that way, that they take out, and so you can be taking this one block might even spread, it, spread these ones over a large area, uh, many gardens. Do you know whether commercial compost operations got hot enough to kill them? I'll get to that later. That's a great question. So actually, I'll get to this right now. So um, <laughs> I'll get to this back, back to this maybe later on as well. So uh, Ms. Y has a large fish. So this, this is something I got from the UVM plant link that caught me up. Uh, I sent an email today, blah, blah, blah. Here's the problem. Ms. Y has a large fish from Ms. Calais. Last year, she purchased uh, about 30 bags of some compost. I will have to watch that and spread them on the garden. She didn't notice worms at the time. This year, the garden is full of large, aggressive worms that she produce out of Investors, well, what she's read online. And so she knows that they are very aggressive, uh, blah, 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 flick of the tail feature. Uh, most disconcerting, this white open an intact bag of XXXXX compost left over from last year and found a large worm in it. So uh, I don't know. So most, most commercial composters will say they don't have a problem. In Wisconsin, I work with people in Wisconsin, and um, they, they reach the Department of Forestry actually reaches out to composters and says, here's what you can do to keep, keep them down. But even what they're saying is probably not going to be very helpful in the, in the end, right? mm -hmm. because worms move around. Yes. What, what do they say? What, what's their control? What's their control is to heat things up really, really well. So oh, the heat, yeah. Heat. So you have to get up to 140 or something like that. To, the ones who will it's die. It's actually there. regulated. I mean, by regulation, farming, agricultural regulation, you have to have. Right, you have I to think have Johnson, a, you know, municipal compost and um, Vermont right. compost, you know, they're, 
that's the process. It's not just throwing garbage in a pile. You know. I understand that. So it's it's an organic certification that, that you have to have, and you have to reach uh, 100 and so it's the heat. degrees for if it's seven heat, days. It kills the eggs. And it kills it kills the eggs. And, and it, kills, it kills, also kills the worms if the worms stay put where it's really hot. On the outside of the compost pile, it's actually just atmospheric temperature, so they move to a comfort zone. So in most compost piles, if they're there, you can reach in about 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 4 inches, and you can pull out worms. Uh, so they don't, they don't have much of a brain, but they're not down the So uh, there is a problem. Uh, with, with composters and so taking care of the, the cocoons is probably relatively easy because they don't move. So if you turn that compost several times, most likely you kill 99% of those cocoons. Uh, but the worms might move and so you, as long as you have adult worms, they'll produce more and more. But they screen um, it. Commercial compost is, I mean, Vermont compost, you buy it. Right. Buy the I pork and it's screened. I understand, totally understand. But, uh, and the screen would catch the eggs. Let's not, get, let's not get stuck on this. I can answer those questions later. Okay. I was just going to comment if, uh, if the compost is on bare ground, you know, they can move in and out from the surrounding area. Right, so this is also. As opposed to a, a slab or something. So you have the time when the compost is hot, and you have the time when the compost is cooling down. It's maturing, they call it. And that's also a time when that compost becomes vulnerable for reinvasion by these worms. So there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and I know that in, in Vermont, composters don't believe that this is a problem. To so I don't know. Uh, history and current extent uh, of the invasion. So part two, there's cherry blossoms there. Uh, do you know where I'm going with that? So there's an anecdote that um, the cherry blossom or the trees Sakura trees uh, that went to, to Washington DC and New York uh, from Japan um, were the ones that brought the particular earthworms, that, particular snake worms that we have here to the US. Mm. Uh, and so the first, uh, the first introduction was uh, I think 1908 uh, and the Japanese had not uh, fumigated that shipment. <coughs> And so they were all destroyed because they, everyone was afraid of. Of course, a few years later, they destroyed them. And guess what? You know, there's probably some worms that came over that back row. And then the second batch was actually properly fumigated. Um, so this is one of the anecdotes as, as how to, they might have gotten here. Vermicomposting uh, is another way of doing this. And so vermicomposting, you can, you, can buy, you can buy these worms, Alabama jumpers, which is the same as snake worms. You can buy those on the internet. So this is, you can't do this in Wisconsin, and you can't do it in New York anymore because here these things are known, are actually legislated and regulated as invasive species. So you can't, you shouldn't, you can still do it, you know, but not so. those are different than the red ones. Different than the red ones. These are the jumper worms. These are the snake worms. And so there, so about five years ago, all these people were saying, oh, this, these are great worms, the ones that are wonderful in the garden, they're aerate, they're, they're, they're at pixie dust and, and your, your flowers and, and pumpkins are going to be five times bigger. Now they kind of say, uh, update, environmental concerns of Alabama jumpers. It should be noted that the Alabama jumpers are surrounded by some controversy. The National Park Service feels that jumpers released into the wild pose a serious threat to the, to the ecosystem. Blah, blah, blah. The allegations, so the last sentence, allegations continues to uh, imply that the Alabama jumper, um, jumper seriously interrupts the national food chain at its most critical level. And uh, we're not taking uh, sides in this debate. However, it's worth looking into. We recommend having a look at some of the research and discussion taking place. And once informed, decide for yourself. So it's not our fault, it's your fault. If you right? so we've warned you. We want you this might be a problem. So now they're a little bit more savvy about selling them on the internet. Um, and I don't think they actually have warnings that this, that this is illegal, uh, this, these are illegal species in some states. Joseph, are, are Alabama jumpers, are they snake worms in fact? Yes, snake worms. Yeah, yeah. Because it's used for a few different species, is it not? Yes, yes I'll get to that answer. 
So uh, they come from Japan, Korea, the ones that we have here, but there's also some that in Taiwan and China and so other places in the US that have different uh, jumper worms, and uh, they might be from China and Taiwan as well. <coughs> and so in Canada, there's one single report, uh, I think 38 states here in the, uh, in the US, or 37 states in the US have, uh, have, jump, have jumper worms. And there's a total of 16 species. Uh, the earliest reports of jumper worms from California, 1860. There was one two species found there. Um, and then you know you look at all the other, you know, all the other ones. I think the, the next closest one was uh, um, 1914 out of Illinois. Uh, in Vermont, 2011-2012. Uh, and you go, where? We've seen those 20 years ago. Well, 30 years ago, and that's very true. So these are first reports by, by people who have identified them. Um, it doesn't mean that only because some identified them then, that's, that's the time when they were first introduced. So it's not first introduction, but first reported in the States. But so it goes, about, it goes back about 150 years now, almost 160 years, um, that they were introduced or at least seen in the, in the US. So in the Northeast, uh, the invasion uh, frequently has these three species together. So if you look at a, at a forest that's invaded, most likely you will find three species of jungle worms. And we call those as crazy snake worms. Uh, Amethyst tokiensis, Amethyst agrestis, and Metaphia dendrophi. And you notice there's two, um, there are two uh, genera there. Uh, there's so there's four genera in the States. Mm -hmm. And then the Metaphy Hilgendorfi used to be an Amethyst Hilgendorfi, and that Amethyst Tokiensis used to be a Metaphy Tokiensis just a little while ago, about four or five years ago. Years ago. So they kind of move around a bit in the taxonomy. It's kind of weird. Uh, how can you tell them apart? Uh, we'll get to that. So here's 12 of the, uh, the worms that exist here in the, in the US. Uh, and the three that we are concerned with here in, in Vermont uh, are Amethyst crestus, which is the one at the top, uh, Amethyst tokiensis, which is that one, and then the Hilgendorfi, which is the largest one. If you see a really big worm, it's probably Amethyst Hilgendorfi. And so you can't really tell them apart by just staring at them or even looking at their size, because there's a big size variation uh, in each population. And so what you have to look at is you have to look at the segments. And so this is an Amethyst agrestis. It's got these three pores uh, between segments uh, uh, eight, seven, and, and uh, five and four, uh, six, uh, six and five. So if you th see these three, uh, these three uh, pores between those segments uh, coming from the nose, like here, these dark little, they're really difficult to see. It's a pain in the neck. Uh, so frequently, you have to open up the worm to figure out what they are. Uh, Tokiensis only has two of those, and then Hilgendorfi is the easiest one to identify. It's got these little patches, uh, just just for <coughs> just about uh, in, in, in eight and nine, um, so just about uh, maybe three or four segments ahead of the the tail, that ring around the collar. So you can identify them if they have these these features. Not all of the worms have these features, even though there might be. These worms. It's really good. Um, right, so extend in the north in the US and Canada. So these are known sites that have where, where they have been confirmed by some scientists uh, that looked at them. So uh, you notice there's nothing in North Carolina and South Carolina, and there's plenty of them there. Yeah. It was just that for some reason they didn't make it on this map. And uh, the dark area here, the darker shaded gray is where they can be by temperature and, uh, and precipitation. Uh, precipitation. So um, the lighter area at the top there in Quebec, uh, Ontario and so on, is where the temperatures are too cold or the growing season is too short for them to mature. Uh, and uh, you should know that these, these are annual worms, so they need to mature within the season. Uh, if they don't have 90 days of frost-free period, then they will not uh, they will not um, propagate and, and go forth and that really decrease. So they, they can go even you know, really high up in Brunswick uh, and I think 
we extend that a little bit further even in Lutheran, you could probably find. They have not been found much in Canada on one side, in Hamilton, Ontario. All right, so part three, the source of genetic variation. And so what you see there is a typical gel. And Mariam Nuri Ayn has uh, produced this gel. And it shows you uh, what shows you one way of identifying this was by genetic means. And it's pretty simple. Uh, if the position of, of this band is right around here, it's Simethus agrestis, the next higher band that you see there is Simethus tokiensis, and then the next higher band after that is Simethus, is a metaphyl living organ. And then sometimes we find that two bands. And that's really exciting because it doesn't match it. It's really, really neat. So it's either somebody contaminated that sample, or there's something weird and wonderful happening that will make Mario uh, rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, we don't know yet, so she's working on it, she's very excited. Um, so we should know something about genotypes and phenotypes. Uh, so genotypes are basically have a, a genotype has exactly the same uh, uh, DNA, so the, the sequences are pretty much the same. Uh, it's the same, the same molecular, uh, same DNA. So if you look at these three lines, these are three different um, genotypes. And then if you look at the, this last uh, graph, um, three genotypes, but they can change, not their DNA, but they can adapt to, um, to the environment. So if you if you have like a handful of worms that, are, that have maybe five or six genotypes in them, you throw them into something, a place that's slightly hotter than where you are at, then maybe only two of them survive because these two uh, genotypes have the ability to adjust to, uh, to the temperature uh, variation. So we're seeing a lot of this, we call that plasticity, and we see a lot of plasticity in these worms and what they eat. So there's some, some species that eat, uh, they really uh, specialize in eating one thing. But these, these worms can outcompete almost all um, uh, soil, soil organisms because they can, they can feed on different things. So if you have something like a millipede feeding on something, then these worms might actually switch over to feeding on what the millipedes have and outcompete them so that millipede is gone. So they really lower the amount of um, arthropods or creepy crawlies in the soil uh, when, when they're present. So ferritinoids, uh, snake worms are pathogenetic. That means they don't have either friend to make little babies. Uh, and so there's some facts that you should know about pathogenetic worms. No sex means no recombination of the DNA. And they should all be exact the same clones. So it's like Star Wars. Clones running on there. Um, DNA should be the same. Um, but what you also should think about is that these worms were everywhere in, in Japan and Korea uh, and other species elsewhere in, in, the, in, in the East. And in each location, at some point in the past, there were hermaphrodites of the species. So they need, they need a friend. And so there's recombination, there was recombination going on a wild bat that we know of. Right? So that means basically that in each location in Japan, you might have a different kind of clone developing, a different lineage, we call that, call that lineage. And so when you, when you, uh, I get lost a second, but uh, so essentially, if you take two worms from Japan from two different positions, uh, two locations, then they might actually be very different genetically. Uh, even though, they're now patho uh, pathogenetic worms. No, they may just be clones in different locations. Um, we look at the genotypic variation at three different sites in Vermont. So we have a place called Centennial Woods, which is near the University of Vermont. Uh, then HRC, which is the Horticultural Research Center. And then the Audubon Society in... Um, Huntington. Huntington, thank you. <coughs> Uh, in Huntington. So you have the three sites and we got words from them and we ran uh, different genetic tests of them. And this is, this is the result of them, right? So if you look at this table, we have, we have two species and we looked at Nymphus adrestis and Nymphus And 
here's the three sites, CW Centennial Woods, Quad Farm or the HRC, Health Research Center, and the Assistance for Water Law Society. We've got 49 worms from CW, 14 uh, worms from HF, and 43 worms from AU. And this is the number of genotypes we found. Out of that 49, there's 24 different genotypes. So they're not all the same, they're not all clones. At uh, the Quad Farm, it was 10 out of 14. 10 different genotypes out of 14 samples. At Audubon, 37 different genotypes out of 43 samples. That's like huge, that's really, really, really diverse. And then uh, for a method to case, we have a similar, a similar kind of variation in the genotypes. So how does that come about? And so our first hypothesis is that this island hypothesis, uh, so you have all these people, people coming from many, many places, and they all go to one place, and from there they spread out in other places, right? So uh, you Americans, you understand that kind of concept, right? So uh, all the lineage is combined. So for us, Ellis Island, for these worms, Ellis Island is some kind of nursery that bought plant materials from uh, in Japan. Right? So all the lineage is combined in, in, in nurseries. So here's all the, the different places in, in Japan where they have been, have been found. And so the climbing ports come from all these places, they go into the nursery, and then the nursery combine, and there might be two or three layers in each pot. And then with all the pots, uh, you get them into various places in Vermont or in New Hampshire or Georgia or wherever. Uh, and you have diversity right away. So that's one hypothesis. The other one is that there is actually sex going on. And that's kind of controversial because, not because it's sex, but because it's more uh, the fact that most people don't believe that these worms have sex. And so if they have, if they have sex, then, so in order to understand what might be going on, you have to understand the way these, these creatures reproduce. And it's complicated. Um, so you have, uh, you must, you have, so in order to have sex, you have to have two worms. And there's a couple of pores that are important. There's, these pores that are labeled as SP, they're called spermatheca. Uh, there's a female pore right here on the tutel, and then there's a male pore which is usually right behind the tutel. Right, in order for, for this to work for them, is they have to line up the male pores with the spermatheca right there. And then the male pore deposits uh, sperm into the spermatheca uh, first step then they can go their separate ways, and eventually uh, one, uh, both worms will produce, so both worms do this at the same time, so you get a mutual exchange of sperm, and then at some point, uh, these worms will produce cocoons. And the way that works is like this. So here's, here's a clitellum that's starting to form a, um, a cocoon around it. So it's a gelatinous sheath, and you notice that it kind of, it kind of uh, becomes denser and moves forward towards the nose of this worm. So while, while this forms around the clitellum, an egg or several eggs are deposited into this, into this clitellum, uh, so into this uh, uh, cocoon, and then the cocoon moves forward, and eventually it, it moves over the spermathesa. And so the spermathesa will then deposit sperm into the cocoon, and here you go. Uh, and eventually, that that cocoon uh, just pinches off, above, you know, off the off the nose. Mm -hmm. And here's your cocoon that is now uh, has a fertile egg in it, fertilized egg in it, and you're going to get likely you're going to get one or two worms developing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, our second hypothesis, level is uh, they have sex. The impossible happens. <laughs> uh, clone reproductive. So we have this, this thing. Uh, we have this, these, these, these worms are really different. If you look at five of them, uh, you will find all sorts of different variations on uh, the possession of uh, sexual organs. And so that's mm -hmm. what we call the clonal reproductive spectrum. So they're on the spectrum, and uh, this is what it looks like. So two to five percent, depending on the on where you look in, in the world, two to five percent of of the worms in a population 
will have a full set of reproductive organs. So technically, they are hermaphrodites. Then there's also uh, two to ten percent that miss male pores. They don't have any male pores, but they do have spermatozoa. So theoretically, something with a male pore could combine with something that doesn't have a male pore, but it does have spermatozoa. Mm -hmm. right, so there's about between uh, four to fifty percent of the worms that could actually have sex, and that could actually produce some of your uh, genetic uh, diversity. Um, so most of these things are actually pathogenetic, but 80% of them are pathogenetic. You really have to look hard to, look hard to find uh, the ones that have a full set of reproductive organs. It's pretty crazy. Um, so what's wrong with that, that picture? What's wrong with that picture is that most, most of the real experts in the field would say, nah, they, can't, they, can't, they don't have sex. I mean, crazy, nobody's ever seen them having sex. But how many of you have sat down and, and watched worms for a couple of days to see whether they have sex. Raise your hands. No one, right? I know it. I know it in church reports. That's what in church reports. That's what in church reports. In church are not what they used to be. They have cell phones. So these guys are having sex and they're kind of texting their friend and then they missed it. Right. Anyway, so. It could also be a hypothesis three, both Ellis Island happens, or the lineages come together in the nursery, and then they have sex, and then you have more um, generation. Okay, we get into the control of our forms. Of snake worms. So that would be uh, very hard to do this because there's a lot of snake worms in your garden or your nurseries. Uh, and it's a little cruel, it's not less or more cruel than other ways of killing them, uh, but it's more direct, it's more like you have to be, you can't be a pacifist. <laughs> so um, there's some hopeful new developments. One is alfalfa meal, and it took me about 10 minutes to get alfalfa spelled. I was with alpha P J. Uh -huh. <laughs> really funny. Anyway, so alf alfalfa meal is, is one. And so there's a horticulturist in Poughkeepsie. She works for uh, a number of outfits, and one is, one is a, a public uh, public garden. Uh, I don't know what it is, I can find out. But uh, she has a lot of these worms, and she wants to get rid of them because it frees, it frees people out of the garden. And so she, she looked at uh, the Ocean Organics uh, early bird fertilizer that has these saponins in them that kill, kill these worms. And she said, well, why, it, why, 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 is, why are these worms, why are they being killed by this, this strange uh, 100 fertilizer? And so she found out there's saponins in them, uh, in, in that fertilizer, and the saponins are irritant to them to the point where the skin gets scorched and, and the worms die. So the hammer might actually be more humane. Um, uh, but she said, you know, I remember from my horticultural days at school that many plants have saponins in there. So it's not just the tea tree that, uh, that, that saponins are derived from in the early bird fertilizer, but there's other things. And she found that alfalfa is also particularly high in these, uh, these saponins. So she bought herself a few bags of uh, uh, horse feed something like that, and horses running around, and they're kind of pellets, and she spread the pellets, and she, she said that she had killed quite a few worms in that process. Not spreading them, but the, she, she kind of waters in there, the pellets start to disintegrate, and then there's uh, death and destruction. Does it kill the other worms? Well, the other worms are just as bad. It's just they don't, they don't just freak out. Does it kill them? Does it kill Isn't that a cabbage worm? Well, the reason why I show that is because that is being killed by something called Bovaria bassiana. Oh. And that's an entomopathogenic uh, fungus, which means it kills insects in the larvae. And uh, so microtrol is one of them. There's quite a few uh, formulations that you can buy. And so we tried that this out. In, we tried this out in, in the lab. We tried this out in the lab. Um, and this is how the cell creatures die. They just the, the fungus takes over and they kind of all the back and die. Um, 
So we had a, a bioassay designed around uh, Bulgaria Bassiana. And so we had a treatment. So when you do these experiments, you have different tre treatments. And one, at least one of them is a control treatment. So the first control treatment was that nothing is added to, uh, to that treatment except for uh, replacing, replacing water that's been lost through evaporation. <coughs> then we had another treatment that had no Bulgaria Bassiana, but it had millet. And so the reason why the millet enters into this picture is because in order to this is one of the theories. In order for for uh, for that Bovaria to stick around for longer, you have to give it something to grow. And so millet happens to be one of the things that that has been tried and that's been shown true to that that need of that Bovaria that it can help the Bovaria to stick around for longer. Uh, so no Bovaria, but we added the millet, and then we also had two treatments of Bavaria Bassiana grown on, on the millet grains. So you actually have to cook the millet and you have to make sure the millet is sterile afterwards, you have to autoclave it, and then you grow your Bavaria Bassiana on it. And so there's two treatments, one, it's one amount and then double the amount of, of the millet being added. And then we also just did Bavaria Bassiana, and when I say we did, I mean Marianne. Did and and one of her helpers, uh, Li Li Wen, who was a uh, was a Chinese student back in China now, uh, who helped her with that. Um, but she also had, well, they, they also had this Bovera uh, Bassiana that was just suspended in uh, horticultural uh, uh, liquid, and it was sprayed on. So solid formulations and a liquid formulation formulation. There was fifteen. We replicated each one of those treatments 15 times. So there's a ton of buckets there that you see, uh, containers actually. Um, and we put six juvenile amethyst worms uh, per replicate into the treatments. And then we put it in a greenhouse, and the greenhouse was, was kept at between 15 and 23 degrees. It went up and down. Um, so in order for this to work, we actually had to uh, prove <coughs> these pots so that the, the worms couldn't squirm out. And they're really the Houdini's they get out of anything. So one thing that worked for another my grad students was to actually put, put hookup wire around the inside of the, the pots. And so they couldn't they could crawl out, but this, the uh, tension and the suction between the worm and, and the side of this wall was broken. And you have two of them, then they can't just go over, they have to go over twice, and it doesn't, they don't seem to be able to do that. And then in addition to that, we put some uh, window uh, mesh on top of that. And window mesh, actually this is an nylon mesh that we put underneath so that they couldn't crawl out to the bottom as well. So it goes a lot into this. And those little white specks, that's the Bovaria Bassiana grown on um, a minute. And so the results were really, really cool. Uh, we found that, so the y-axis has mortality on it, so what's the percentage of them that die? And then here's the treatment. It's control uh, with water, control with millet but no bassiana, and then different bassiana treatments now. And you notice that uh, the control with water, they, there was some, some mortality, so it's, it's a mortality that happens because worms die. And so what you have to do is you have to check this mortality um, of the control against the mortality of the other ones. Is this mortality actually higher than that? And so in all cases of the, the Bassiana treatment, uh, that uh, the treatment was greater than the control. That means that has an effect. Um, then uh, for the control with the millet, there was a lot less um, death and destruction, less, less mortality. And so one of the reasons why this might have happened is because the millet is actually good food for these worms. So any, anything you add uh, to your soil that is organic, uh, they will feed on. And so it will help them uh, come back. So we, we then looked at also looked at how many of those juveniles had become adults. And so this particular treatment with the control of the millet, pretty much everything that was alive in there had become an adult. And so Feeding them, this kind of shows, shows you, if you feed them with mulch or by increasing your organic matter, 
it's basically you're just increasing the, num increasing the number of creatures. Yes. What is the time frame? The time frame was uh, two weeks. And they check, actually, this is the, this is the final outcome. They check every, every uh, three days, I think, how many had survived. That was the final outcome. Did you compare against the alfalfa treatment? We didn't, so I'll come to alfalfa in a minute. Uh, that was a different, different experiment. So, so we, killed, we killed the worms, but then there's these really hard cocoons. And um, <coughs> cocoons dry moist, so on, on the right hand side is the, the moist ones, on the left hand side is the, uh, the dry ones. And so this, this is why they're hardy. They can, they, can lose, uh, they can lose water, and so neither drought nor frost can do them harm. They will not develop when they're in this stage, so the embryos that are in, this, in these cocoons are not developing during the time that, that, they are, that the cocoons are dehydrated. Um, but as soon as they're rehydrated, that, that embryonic development continues, and eventually uh, they will hatch. And it takes about 600 degree days, phase five, that's Celsius. So um, I can do the math. So it's about 1,000 degree days Fahrenheit at base 40. Um, yeah, they're just as hardy as you guys. Mm. So another question that we had was, uh, is there a cocoon that just like a seed bag, right? So do they survive for longer than just one? One season, and so we we counted we counted the uh, the cocoons uh, in the forest uh, over an entire season, and you noticed that regardless of season, there was always fair fair number of you know 500 cocoons per square meter. Of course, you say, well, you know, they're not all viable, right? So they, there's a lot of dead cocoons there. They can't possibly be all viable. So let's have a look at the next. So um, Mariam, uh, being who she is, she likes to have meticulous things going on. So she, she said, I'm going to dissect you know, 300 or 400 cocoons and see what stage they are at through the seasons. And so she defined some stages. So this is the stage where there's just the albumin, the, the, the fluid that feeds the, the embryo in there. And there's another stage. Uh, the embryo is slightly elongated. Uh, you can see some segmentation already. And then stage three, it's longer. Stage four is even longer. It's becoming more uh, pigmented. And then uh, stage five, it's, it's fully pigmented. And uh, it's the size of a, of a hatchling. And so if you, if you now do this for many things, different months of the year, you should get an idea of what, what is happening during those months. When, are there any cocoons in the winter time, for example, that can that can hatch. Are there any cocoons in the summer that can hatch? And uh, look at this. The, she defined ready to hatch as these two um, stages. And this color here is ready to hatch. From January all the way through December, there's always some that are ready to hatch. March, April, unfortunately, we don't have any data. Uh, March, there's very few to hatch, but they tend to hatch a lot uh, in March and April. In May, uh, then in June there's lot to hatch. This, this, just every month you find that they're ready to hatch, which is really a, which is a sign that there might be a cocoon back. There's always something that hatches. So if they're in that stage where they're ready to hatch, they would be vulnerable to death, right? That's the they're vulnerable to death all the time. But I mean, if they're in a cocoon state, they're less likely to die than if they're already so. Environmental circumstances, if they get to that point where they're ready to hatch and then they, the circumstances aren't right, they perish. Right, if, if, if they actually hatch into a bad, into a bad, bad time of the year, so in the winter time, they do hatch in the winter time, we've seen it, I've measured that. You know, but the temperature has to be something like 50 degrees for them to, to hatch. So you're looking at January thaw or something like that where the temperatures rise in the winter time. And then they come out, and then what they don't know is that the next day or the day after that, the month hits back with like minus 20 or something, you know, and, and they die. 
So they're safe in the cocoon once they stick their nose out, uh, they're, they're in trouble. So one reason why that is important is because the growing season is lengthening as climate change goes on. And so most of that lengthening is happening in the springtime. It's to that point where you know, some people that are in the, uh, in the, in the maple syrup production side of, uh, of things, they're saying eventually you know, there's going to be one maple syrup season and it's going to be around Christmas because you know, the growing season has extended so much. Um, and so these worms can take advantage of these, these uh, shorter winters and say, OK, short winter, I'm good. And then they get more time to develop. And that means that they have longer time as adults to produce cocoons, which means that the following year there's one time more than they can do before. So cocoons are much harder to deal with. So uh, uh, Mariam and uh, Iggy also um, put cocoons into little tea bags, uh, and then they buried those in the in the same pots, and then they looked at how these cocoons. Uh, how much of the, the cocoons were at the end of the, end of the, the, end of the, uh, uh, the experiment. So there is a difference between the, the Bassiana treatment and the control treatments in terms of mortality. Um, but you're talking about maybe 30% mortality of the cocoons. They're much harder than the ones are. It's really hard for something to go through those uh, the, the, the cocoon um, shells. So at some point, we also looked at uh, the naturally occurring pathogens. And for that, Mariam uh, opened up cocoons. So she collected dead worms. It's really difficult to find dead worms, so she worked really hard at that. Uh, worms decompose really quickly. Uh, and then, but if you see a dead worm or one that is really, really sick to die in a few minutes or something like that, you pick it up. And then you can extract, you can grind it up, you extract uh, Isolate uh, pathogens from that, or isolate um, uh, bacteria, fungi from from that sample. Uh, and she also did this from from um, uh, from cocoons. So this is a malformed uh, embryo uh, that is diseased by something, probably a fungus, uh, and she extracted or isolated things from that as well. So you have to have special agar and uh, uh, that that selects for particular uh, for particular uh, bacteria and fungi. And so she, she found three that were actually pretty good. There's a there's a there's, there's four treatments here, control treatment with nothing and uh, mycelium, staphylococcus and bacillus um, strains. Um, we don't know which strain they are, but they came from either a worm or a, a cocoon. And the different colors are actually the the time frame. So the blue is 96 hours after application of the um, uh, of the pathogen. 144 hours is is the uh, the orange, and then 240 hours is the uh, uh, is the gray. And you notice in the beginning nothing is happening. Even after 96 hours, it's really not much mortality. Uh, but after after uh, 90, uh, 20, 144 hours or 240 hours, you actually have a pretty big mortality goal. So the problem with these um, natural, naturally occurring pathogens is that nobody ever tested them for uh, whether humans are affected by them. So uh, penicillin, so penicillin, people are allergic. Staphylococcus, there are some staph infections, and bacillus. There's a whole bunch of diseases go with that as well. So, you know, we are really kind of not happy with uh, taking those out into the field. But Bovina Bassiana is is regarded as as an agent uh, that is this little concern, and EPA actually has given uh, horticulturally uh, has given them the permission to use it without much oversight. So are there promising agents? So there's some that are based on supponents. Um, T seed extract that's the early bird, alfalfa, the horse feed that uh, G 
Jim Campbell uh, has tried out. And then there's a mustard, it's another irritant that, that if you don't wash the mustard off the worm, the worm will die. And then there's some solid uh, disruptors like really sharp sands, some construction sands might work, and then biochar might also work. What are the natural predators in the Asiatic habitat? Uh, good question. We don't know. So there's, there's so generally there's um, salamanders and birds that feed on them. Uh, and we went to uh, Japan and worked with some people that didn't really know either. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. How does the biochar work? Say again, please. How, how does it work? Do they ingest it like sand? Or they, they ingest or the they have to crawl over it? Or? No, they ingest the sand and that kind of uh, disrupts the guts. It cuts okay. their guts open. The same with biochar? The same with biochar. It has to be a particular biochar so it's the right size. Fine. And, yeah. and perfectly fine, and uh, people recommend to use hardwood biochar. To, to use what with biochar? Hardwood. Hard, hardwood biochar. Hardwood biochar. Mm -hmm. What about diatomaceous earth? That, uh, that has been shown not to work. Oh, really? Oh. Mm -hmm. It does not? Mm -hmm. I don't know why it should, right? I mean, same idea. <laughs> so, we, so I tried some of those things in the lab. There's four treatments, control, there's biochar, uh, there's furry friends, which is alfalfa based pellets, uh, and then there's alfalfa meal, which is ground up stuff. And we had six replicates per treatment and six words per, per replicate, and we looked at it the same day that we applied it, nothing happened. We were not seven days later and 16 days later. And so this, this are, these are the results. Um, each one of these segments is, that's delineated by one of these blue lines. Is a time is a time that we sample. So uh, zero days is one, seven days, and sixteen days. So it takes a while for any of these things to really have an effect. Again, it's mortality on, on here on the scale, so from zero to one hundred percent. And the, the best is was actually the biochar. Um, then the next one was the furry friends, and uh, the uh, alfalfa meal didn't have an effect. Didn't work. It didn't work. Didn't work. Mm. All right, so, so and then the last part of this talk is how can you get involved, right? So one of the ways you can do this is by if you have seen a snake worm, take a picture of it and upload it to a database with coordinates. So there's different ways to get coordinates. If you have a cell phone, it usually gives, gives you, if you have the location thing on, gives you coordinates. Um, or the other way to do it is uh, figure out where, where you are, then look at um, Google Earth, for example, and you get the coordinates from that as well. And uh, there's two, next there's, there's probably quite a few more, but these two have been used uh, frequently to do images forms. <coughs> I'm not in big invasives. There is a, a Vermont version of this, so every state has a different has a version. And at the moment the Vermont version is not really working well because it takes it takes a person to give you permission to have an account. You have to have an account to collaborate on this. And uh, for some reason that's not happening. So I try to uh, sign up so I can show you this and I and I and I didn't get any email back from anybody. I'm not, I'm not an account. I don't have an account yet. Uh, but uh, I was assured by somebody else who has worked with, uh, with these databases that uh, in April this year they would make that account um, signing up for accounts uh, automatic. So you just sign up for it and you are you are signed up. Who the accounts? Mm -hmm. Who, who is administering this site? It's uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation for Vermont, but it's a nationwide site. There's no Vermont organization. I mean, it's not part of any government. It's a separate staff. It's just a person who, who has to press a button. Why do you need a person to press a button when you have a computer can press a button? Mm -hmm. Stay page, right? I mean, that's what they're trying to do this, this April. So once, once that has happened, um, once that has happened, I will create a, a specific project and you can report to that project on imappinbasis.org. Uh, 
but I, I will send you instructions. I will get involved with that. I will send instructions to the entire group. Uh, so the other, other thing that the way you can get involved is through, through the co collaborations. Uh, many of the, uh, the state and federal agencies that look at pests, they, um, they distinguish between two kinds of collaborators. There's collaborators that actually do something, and then there's stakeholders that will be affected by, by what you do. So if you were to sign up as a gardener, then you'd be, uh, and you said, I, I, I can give you some I can give you some uh, space to spread the Bovaria basiana, then you're a collaborator. Uh, if, you, if you're a gardener and you say, I'm interested in that, but I'm not going to collaborate, uh, wait until there's some results, then you're, then you're a stakeholder who's, who's interested in, in the results. Same for nurseries, uh, uh, same for landscapers and people that want to get involved. So one of the things that we're really interested in is some verifiable damage reports. That means you see the worms, you see the damage that you have not seen before to a plant, and you put that. Um, there's always then a question, is it the worm or something else? Uh, but that would be really important to say that here's a risk of plants that have been at least anecdotally linked to, uh, the damage is linked to, to these, these earth worms. Um, so the other way is, you know, the standard report then is trials. You, are you willing to be part of a trial? And for home gardeners, it's the same thing. Nurseries and, and home gardeners should, should report the same kind of information or get involved in trials. So we always look for somebody who is willing to uh, put their plants on the line. Report to whom? To uh, to me, or I, I'll give instructions when that I, I'm mapping this and stuff. <coughs> So you bring cocoons in to someone's garden for the trials? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said you really sacrifice your plant. <laughs> no, you should sacrifice your plants to, to the mustard solution or to the Oh, mustard. mustard. Or uh, the Bovaria bassiana. I mean, the or biochar. Okay. Or biochar or something like that. But you don't have, but to, you don't have to have. I was them. trying to be funny. <laughs> Pardon? I was trying to be funny about oh. sacrificing your plant. I mean, it's like being, okay. like being a... Well, how can you test something if you don't have the, well, the worms? Well, you would have to have the worms to be able to... You would. You yeah. have to have the worms. But you wouldn't. Let's where they are. If you have them, okay. then uh, that's bad for you, but that might be good for the project. Yes. I yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get them. No. So uh, you can also get involved in collections and workshops. Uh, so participate whenever a workshop is offered, uh, and we get some funding through the federal government. And there's funding in there for workshops where you can learn how to identify these worms uh, and uh, and how you can participate in, in research. Uh, and that's all grant dependent, of course. And then uh, there's other challenges you can. So working with horticulture is really difficult because on the one hand. Uh, most horticulturalists that have them in, in the nurseries, the nursery owners, they say we don't want them really uh, because uh, there, may be, there may be some kind of regulation on, on uh, coming up. I don't think in Vermont this is going to happen anytime soon, but Wisconsin and New York have them. In, even in California they have, they, they have listed these ones as uh, invasive and in agriculture even. Uh, and then there's customers that are becoming more sensitive to these worms. You know, you say, well, I'd rather not have these worms. Uh, I'll find a different nursery or something, I don't know. Uh, but there's still a key interest in the green industry to uh, get rid of them and, and in some cases to co collaborate uh, with, uh, with researchers. And then the, the funding, funding issue, earth worms are good, of course. Uh, what is your problem, you know? Why do you even mention earth worms to us when you want money for uh, pest control. Uh, is it really a problem? It can't be that bad. You know, there's no data on plant damage, as I mentioned before. There's no stakeholders that come forward to the stakeholders. There's, and there's no money. Um, then there's, of course, uh, well, what is the economic damage threshold at which you have to come in and control? So an IPM setting, integrated pest management, you always look for 
this is the level of infestation if it's too low to deal with. If you're not really losing much of your crop, then you're not intervening. But if it's really high, there's, there's a point where you say, actually, it's worth your while intervening at this point because I'm going to lose you know, 60, 70 percent of my crop at this level of infestation. And so we don't know that for, for these worms. We know that for all sorts of uh, insect pests, but not for, for these worms. So how to convince state and federal agencies that this is an important issue? Um, right, so here's a typical review. We get applicants are well positioned in the industry to evaluate the problem and to send any findings and results. That's good, right? So you see reading that after you have, we're sorry, but we're not finding you. We this. Why not? We are, we are well positioned in the industry. <laughs> Proposal is, funded, is focused on a single issue and is succinct. Create a problem given uh, the damage done in states like Minnesota. Could have a huge impact uh, on medical industry. Nearly 100% match. Uh, that means the university of people. Provide indicators for outcome uh, in uh, the letter of interest. Uh, demonstrates that they are prepared to do the work. Recognize the data, blah, blah, blah. Applicants has not convinced me in the case that this is a problem in the world. So, you know, after you write three paragraphs in there that are, that are kind of showing what they say, has my point of And I always refer to uh, what you would say that. But anyway, so it's, it's mainly for vegetable. Uh, so these, some of these grants are for uh, specialty crops. Horticulture is part of that. But it's usually the vegetable people that are involved in evaluating these, uh, uh, these grants. And uh, anyway, so. Here's the other one. Specialty crop, stake crop stakeholders described seem to be those already involved in the project. So we had a letter from uh, Greenworks, and they said we have this many members, and you know we're willing to collaborate and find find, find people that are willing to uh, do the tests. And they're saying, well, then Greenworks and all those people are, are collaborators, and there's there's no stakeholders. Stakeholders. And he says there's no stakeholders in, the, in this state. <sighs> Anyway, so it's, it's tough. So, do you know any Russian famous people? <laughs> uh, that's, that's actually how we got funding through the Epic Foundation, through Russian famous people. That's a question, Yeah, otherwise, uh, well, we have to be famous. We just have to be rich. Yeah, yeah I don't know, but rich and famous enough. helps because the famous people then talk about what, what yeah, and then get more. Like All right, questions. One, two. Questions. Um, I hate killing all the worms. So you need to tell, remind me of why the other worms aren't good. Because they do the same thing. So if they get into the woodlands and they, the, the very first damage to Vermont uh, forests uh, by earthworms was done by European earthworms. So you, you, walk, you walk through the forests in the Champlain Valley, most of the time you find four or five or six species of European worms and they have done the damage. They're just much slower. Uh, I don't know how slow they are. We don't know. Uh, they're, they're pretty, pretty fast. Three years, and, and they will have worked through the, the duff layer. All the years of being taught. It's really yeah. difficult to get rid of that. You know, <laughs> if you were in the south, you could say you could say that. You could say, well, there is there's uh, uh, worms here that are native, and I don't even want to kill them. And then you have a point. So for these worms, if you're in the forest, uh, sometimes they're the only worm that's left in the forest because they are compete the other ones. Um, they're really good at, at competing with other creatures. What's Two or three. the temperature? When do they die from freezing? Uh, they when die when like they're on the polar vortex. <laughs> yeah, by the time the polar vortex comes by, they're already dead. Um, because the wind has winter. been... Yeah, so winter they, in general? They're not around the winter, they're annual creatures. So they, they only live from April, as well as they live from April to maybe the beginning of December maximum. So every, every time you have a frost, frost, so you hear you're talking late September, early... But the early, cocoons. Early October, but they they, the worms die. But the cocoons don't. The cocoons will still be around. The cocoons, we've don't seen... Freeze. No. No, we have temperatures here in, in the soil itself, not in not right. atmospheric, minus 24, about four years ago. Really, really cold winter, and 
minus 24 Celsius, that's like minus 30 uh, Fahrenheit, and the cocoon survived. Mm. But they, uh, they desiccate, uh, so the way these cocoon, the embryos would die is if they're froze, so and, and uh, there was crystals forming, water crystals forming inside the, the embryo. Uh, that disrupts the cells, and then they, they die. But because they are de desiccating in the winter time, uh, there's no crystals forming within the water to allow that crystal to form. One and two. Okay, I have a question about the control with the alfalfa. And when I in this part of that slide, you found that there really wasn't a big difference in alfalfa. Between the uh, between the alfalfa that was ground up and the, the control. Yes, there was, there was not really any difference. So it's not, my question is, we have debris piles, and that's where you know they're staying overwintering, and it's just constantly feeding them. And my thought when I read the bulletin was, oh, maybe that's a possibility of putting the alfalfa around the outer edges of it, but you're saying it's not really going to matter. Uh, so I should try Okay, so, the alfalfa, so it seems that the alfalfa, and we don't know why that is, but that the alfalfa works when it's not ground up. Oh, pellets. Right, so the pellets, pellets. Seem to work. pellets. Okay. pellets seem to work, and the ground up, the meal doesn't seem to work at all. And okay. it's, there's no good reason why that should be, but... Uh, so what do they put on the pellets to make the pellets? I don't know. Mostly it's just compression of moisture. Most compression, compression is just that. Compression? Um, just like most of the animal pellets and the grain that you buy. Um, question about how that affects other aquaponics in this one. I know that just critters. Uh, good question. So it would have to be a critter that, that feeds on organic materials. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's probably not the feeding that's the problem. It's more that, that, that they touch the pellets with their bodies and that that irritates the skin and that might kill them. Okay. Um, so the other thing um, that you had mentioned, they're talking about the actual damage to the plant. What I find with our clients is the expense of actually having their gardens mulch. A two inch layer of mulch doesn't last a whole season mm -hmm. and it's incredibly expensive. I mean, they're spending a couple of thousand dollars every year. We used to do it every other year. We now have to do it every year. And this is the part that I often see with the horticultural world is it's sort of a nickel and diming. The um, fish and wildlife people don't understand the damage of deer and how we support the hunting community. Um, because you know, you miss a few bucks, or you miss a few, you miss a few, you no know, big deal. You collectively take what it costs to have a pest like a deer or these worms, it ends up being huge. And I don't know how that, if there's anyone looking at, you know, the cost of them outside of the actual plants. Yeah, so uh, estimating that kind of cost apparently costs money. <laughs> right, so you would have to have an economist, agricultural economist, to look at that. How much does this cost? Uh, not just you as the as the uh, uh, landscape person, but also then the cost is passed on to the customer. And then there's another part of that cost is actually societal cost, right? So when that wood is being composed, you're liberating nutrients, which is good for for the plants if the plants can pick it up. But if the plants don't pick it up, that excess nutrient that is, is uh, produced will run off in a, in a big storm or it will leach into groundwater and so there's, there's another side to this which is, uh, which is societal cost. Somebody has to, has to pay for that, right? So if it's not us, then maybe it's the next generation that, I don't know, and it, it's actually more complicated and that's why these things cost money. Um, uh, there would have to be uh, trials, you know, you'd have to have a trial somewhere where you can have different plots with different amounts of earthworms on it to figure out what is a, uh, what is a uh, economic threshold at which you say there's too many earthworms here because uh, that march is disappearing much quicker. So you have to have set that up. So it costs money and nobody's really interested in that. That's yes. far down the list. Yeah, who cares? We have so many other problems, uh, climate change, we have uh, starving people elsewhere, and that's, that's really a, a good a good point, right? So how big is this problem? Can we tolerate it compared to these other all these other bigger problems that are out there? So it's a first. 
in my case, it's the first four or five I do high end landscape gardens, and you know, nobody really needs them. Two questions. How tiny are the cocoons? Uh, they are between two and four millimeters, which is a twelfth and a, an eighth of an inch. That's me. It does, I think I see. And the other one is, uh, can we throw these into water while they drown? The cocoons? No, the, the worms. Themselves. Um, they will drown eventually. You have to figure out how they don't crawl out of your container. Yeah. It's really a horrible slurry that you get. <laughs> crawl out of the containers because what we do in my crew is we have five gallon buckets and we just grab a bunch of mulch and put just a thin bit of mulch and if they have that in the bottom of the five gallon they bucket they won't climb out. If you don't have mulch they're out before you can put the next one in. Yeah, so yeah, putting really that layer of really mulch keeps well, them in. My experience, I, I did that. I, mean, I, was, I started out collecting them for you. Right. And then I, I, right, I, don't, I don't remember all the details, but I had water in the bottom of the five-gallon bucket, and I threw them in there trying to figure out what I was going to do. And they did, they did die, and they didn't crawl out. But as you say, it's a terrible smell. Yeah. And, uh, of, I, it wasn't pleasant. I was thinking of throwing them into the swamp or the pond. <coughs> yeah, that would happen. That would happen. Yeah. Yeah, the, and the smell, the smell is horrendous. I mean, we do these these uh, uh, these tests on, on mortality uh, bioassays. It's a smelly affair. So you, know, you, you walk into the greenhouse, go into the lab, and, and you smell and say, "Oh yeah, some some have died, but I can start counting." You know? So uh, one other thing too um, for Ms. Y of Callis, she stated that um, they're aggressive and seem intelligent. And agree with them, you know, they seem to come at you. <laughs> yes, that too. Can you talk more about biochar? Because I was just about to to start using it because I read some really good reports. But um, can you just talk a little bit more about how biochar benefits our soil? Because it oh, that's a really good question. So uh, biochar was really big. Uh, came came into its own uh, in the early. And uh, maybe a little bit earlier than that, as, as a way of uh, capturing carbon and burying that carbon in, in the soil as a way of sequestering carbon. And so biochar is very resilient to breaking down further. So uh, basically, biochar can be produced from any kind of organic material, uh, as, uh, and it's produced the same way as, as charcoal. It's basically, you smolder it until it stops doing things, so until it's stabilized, right? So, um, that means you're burning it at really low temperatures and uh, low temperatures at 600 degrees Celsius or something like that and low oxygen content, so you're not combusting it. It's really a small thing sort of thing. Uh, so, and um, how is it, so depending on, so that, that's how you, you have all this organic waste and what you can do with it. You can either uh, give it compost with the CO2, carbon dioxide comes out of it because it's being decomposed further and further and put back on the land and it's great for that, but um, it will break down further. So if you have all this waste and you want to keep it in the soil, you have to stabilize that, that organic carbon, and you do that by this biochar process. So that's why that was becoming big in the 90s, uh, maybe the early 2000s. And then gardeners and vegetable, organic vegetable growers got a hold of this idea, and the, the, the thought was, it's people found this, area in Brazil where there was these dark soils, these, these charred soils, high carbon, but highly stable carbon, uh, I think it's called Terra Preta, is that what it is, Terra Preta, uh, and, and it's really, really uh, fertile soil. And so I said, why don't we use that, that same thing, let's, let's get, let's, let's produce this biochar and bury it in gardens. So there's a couple of things that you need to know about biochar. So, uh, people talk about it very enthusiastically. Some people have really good experiences with them, with, with biochars, different kinds of biochars, and some people haven't seen any, any effect. And it really depends on 
how that biochar is produced and what it's produced from. So the oxygen content of, of the, uh, the reactor has to be just right to produce the right kind of biochar. And then whatever you put in it also has to be the right kind of structure. Uh, it has to be, I don't know. But what people find is that some of the things that are attributed to biochar will develop over time. Uh, so sometimes you first put it in and you don't see any increase in cation exchange capacity, which is one of the ways that you can store nutrients uh, in the soil at all. But then after 10 years, people say, oh, yeah, I've got greater, uh, greater uh, cation exchange capacity. Mm -hmm. So it might take some time to develop depending on what kind of biochar you're using. Then another uh, thing that people uh, worry about in biochar is uh, that it may have an effect on things like worms. Apparently, mean, that works. Um, and that might be a positive or negative thing, depending on how you do it. Um, so the worms eat it or just slide? They eat it. They, they eat the, it. the theory is that they eat it. They eat it. Right, so well, maybe it absorbs all of their toxins, because it's an absorbent. It's in the filters for filtration. Yeah, that's another good point. I don't know about that. So people haven't done enough real science on it. So that, that's, this is not real science. This is just basically a trial, and we see an effect. But why? Why is that effect there? Is another question. So people think it's the disruption of the gut by sharp edges on hardwood biochar. That's 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 a theory. But it could also be that something is released from that biochar as as uh, as the biochar goes through the gut of the earth. I wonder if it's not even on the external part of the body because you were speaking earlier about when it gets punctured, it just it just mm -hmm. explodes. But, Maybe, but, I don't know. That's, that's, I don't know. I haven't seen anything explode yet other than the whole body. But there's another thing about, so coming back to your, your initial question. So nowadays, people co compost biochar with, with compost. So they, and that is supposed to load that biochar with, uh, with nutrients. So all the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and so on. Uh, so it's supposed to have, have a better effect than if you were to just add biochar. So add, add your biochar, if you buy biochar, add it to your compost pile, mm -hmm. turning it, and then, and then put that on there. What period of time? Depends on how you compost. So if you have just a compost in the backyard, then probably a year or something, mm -hmm. uh, and then if you... Uh, what if we integrate it into already made compost? I don't know. Good question. That would help me. I want it fast. Yeah, we'll try to keep posted through the party plant club what we know and what we get from you. I mean that's a big a way we can connect your work with us. Right. Unless you have another suggestion for what we can do. Well, I, I, I can post things on, on the list of as well. Absolutely. I'll send it to you. Yes, right. Yeah. Well, you can do it or you can do it. Oh. Yeah, that's okay.